Very good. Sorry? Yep. Great. Good morning. It is 9 a.m., 9.01 a.m. Pacific time. And um, I'm uh, so delighted to see so many participants. Uh, we have uh, more than 80, 80 participants already in this um, uh, second Gießen webinar. Today's um, webinar, we have uh, kind of a interesting um, agenda, which is a little bit different from what we announced. And um, the agenda of today is um, heat transfer principles, review of air pressure options, air pressure profiling options. We'll do, of course, a live roasting session and we will do a live cupping session. And uh, I'm very excited to um, also see uh, various friends here from around the world. So, uh, I, you know, being locked up here in California is for me a very unusual thing. Although California is not a bad place to be locked down. Marcus and I have been enjoying uh, many um, cupping sessions using all um, social distancing and we've been um, able to... Uh, do a lot of experimentation with um, our Gießen roasters here at uh, Boot Coffee Campus. But you know, I want to say that I miss you all. Um, I, I hope to be able to venture later this year, next year, back into the world of coffee as a live human being rather than as a virtual person. Uh, and I think that accounts the same for Marcus and uh, we hope to see you uh, all whenever possible here at our training sessions. By the way, we are doing uh, a lot of um, uh, e-learning sessions using our Gießen machinery as well. Uh, uh, let me do some screen sharing. Um, so today it will be me, it will be Marcus, and it will be our uh, W6A uh, Gießen machine. Um, for you, you all, the participants, um, if you have specific questions where it comes to the Q&A um, session, then um, use the chat window um, for that and I will uh, try to uh, keep up with that uh, as, well as, as well as possible. I'm going to, while we talk, I'm going to um, see if I can start up a live streaming of this uh, webinar through YouTube and um, because we might be exceeding our number, number of participants that we can allow in our uh, Zoom account. That doesn't happen often, I must tell you. Uh, it, it seems like uh, roasters using Gießen or looking at roast using Gießen roasters are Okay, so we are now also live on YouTube and um, those that are trying to log in to um, the webinar and find that they um, cannot access because there's no more room in this um, webinar um, session, then they can follow this webinar on YouTube as well. So that's really cool. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see, here is my, yeah. Um, so, and then let me put this in play. So this is today's um, list of discussion topics. 
first we, we, we start at, with the basics of heat transfer. Then uh, we will go into air pressure profiling. Um, this is of course a, a feature that Gießen machines offer. As far as I know, um, Gießen roasters are the only roasters where air pressure profiling is really a, um, um, yeah, a, a, a parameter that can be used to create profiles. We will do some live roasting and some live cupping. And um, some of these interactions here, um, we are, Marcus and I have been um, testing this all out, but we, we might still occasionally have some hiccups in our technical cap capabilities. Uh, this is uh, myself, this is Marcus. Uh, we combined, we have, um, um, you know, I'm not exaggerating, half a century of coffee experience. That sounds very scary, but at the same time, it sounds really cool that uh, in a lifetime of coffee, you're able to go this deep uh, into uh, roasting into cupping, into quality management of coffee. I started roasting very early on. My uh, first Gießen roasting experience was about uh, 15 years ago. And one of the very first machines that um, Wilfred, uh, Wilfred Gießen uh, built. And um, I was, you know, immediately kind of blown away by the um, capabilities of Gießen of um, conveying um, heat, of bringing heat to the coffee, and the ability for the roaster, for myself as, as a test pilot then, to be able to modulate that heat transfer and to modulate the, the rate of rise. And um, uh, that I think as a, as a, as a phenomenon where Giesen's uh, ability to do this so well, that, that is a, powerful thing. Over the years, Gießen has been able to um, uh, develop certain features of their roasting machines um, to, a, yeah, to a deeper extent. They have been um, true and loyal to their original um, uh, concepts of building roasters, which means, you know, powerful motors, powerful fans and cast iron. And uh, I've been a very strong advocate of cast iron because of the fact that I like cast iron so much as a uh, heat transfer uh, medium. Um, and I can elaborate more on that later. So when we talk about um, heat transfer, then, you know, this is of course basic stuff, but you know, it's always good to start with the basics. When we talk about heat transfer, then we're always talking about, we're always discussing the transfer of heat from a hot source to a cold or colder um, medium. In this case, the source is the burner and the medium is the, um, uh, the bed, the batch of uh, coffee being roasted. When it comes to using uh, gas burners, whether it's propane, natural, or butane, or any other biogas, then um, you're always aiming to create like a, 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 a gas mixture, a gas-air mixture, before these, uh, this mixture produces a flame. Obviously, we have other um, heat carriers that can be um, electric burners. There are different configurations in that. Um, there are uh, different types of burners that one can find also on bigger machines like a power burner. But in this specific case, we are looking at burners that usually are so-called ribbon burners. Um, and these are burners made on a... Um, hey Marcus, could, could you pass me one of those ribbon burners? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I pulled out a, a ribbon burner from one of the Giza machines. Here, here you see the ribbon burner from a uh, W6, I believe. And these are... Um, the individual segments of these burners are made uh, with, with high precision um, uh, equipment 
which allows that each of the segments of the burners produces uh, exactly the same amount of heat output as the other sections. Um, this is unlike burners where you would have jets or where you would have uh, the older style ceramic nozzles, um, which you can find on older German roasters. Those are ne not necessarily always that precise. These ribbon burners that are made in this way, they allow for very precise control of heat. And that's uh, also um, very powerful in the case of where you need to um, um, adjust your gas pressure in order to get the right flames. And so, so I think this whole topic of heat transfer of course leads into the discussion uh, of what type of um, heat transfer do you want to uh, produce? Do you, are you looking at conductive heat? Are you looking at convection heat? Are you looking at radiation heat? Uh, and in each of these heat transfer principles, conduction, convection, radiation, will have its own um, outcome on the, on the roasting process by itself. And so if we first define, you know, what is conductive heat? Yeah, of course, conductive heat is, is the heat by, by touch. So it's the heat that you perceive when you touch something, right? And so conductive heat is the heat transfer process in which we are um, transferring kinetic energy uh, of the burner to the material, to the medium, to the coffee. And that can be through direct contact between the um, uh, um, hot surface of the drum to the beans. And as you probably know, most decent roasters have double wall drums. Or it can be direct contact between the beans themselves. So conductive heat in that way uh, can be drum to the bean and bean to the bean. Um, if you look at the next option for heat transfer, uh, then we talk about convection heat. So, so what, is the, what is convection heat? Practically, it's the heat that we transfer through preheated air. And with uh, Gießen roasters, like with other roasters, but with Gießen roasters, there's ample opportunity for air to pass the burners before this hot air um, is fed through the roasting drum, through the coffee. And as you probably know, those of you who have been looking into their Gießen roaster or into the roaster they use, most drum roasters have a perforated screen on the back um, through which that preheated air is channeled. And then in the drum itself, we have a mixing going on where the uh, drum, the rotational direction movement of the drum will allow the beans to rotate and also the uh, veins that are in the drum, these pedals, they allow the beans to rotate um, to pass from the back to the front. So you have two motions going on and that's in combination with a, a good amount of um, convection heat will give you an optimum um, um, mixture between the heat source and the coffee itself. And so in the diagram that we see on the lower left part of this slide, we can see a single bean surrounded by hot air and airflow and the burner power, they're really related to the speed of your roast. So, and the speed of your roast is the rate of change or the rate of rise. And in many machines, um, I would say in most circumstances where you have a high flame, so a lot of heat with high airflow, that will almost always result into a faster rate of change. So in a higher rate of rise, due to the increase in the convective heat transfer. And so the opposite, if you have a high airflow with a lower burner setting, then that will have the opposite effect. That will uh, put the brakes on the rate of rise. 
And so we have had conductive heat, convection heat so far. And then before I move on, we also have, of course have radiant heat. Now with the uh, Gießen machines, like with other machines, as you probably know, moving a machine, a roasting machine around is a back breaking effort. Um, so these machines are heavy. Our friends at Gießen, um, they, they are one of those culprits, manufacturers, most guilty of making their machines very heavy, which ultimately, once you have moved your machine and you you're, have passed over your, your hurting back, then it's all okay. Because I think a heavy roasting machine, having used the, the right materials, contributes to being able to do your roast very consistently. So the, the overall mass of your, your roaster contributes to that. You should try to lift the faceplate of a W15. Now that by itself is a major effort. So the faceplate, that cast iron faceplate is very heavy. So that faceplate together with other um, cast iron components of the Gießen contributes to that radiant heat transfer. Um, cast iron has the property also because it's on a relative scale compared to carbon steel, for example. It's uh, porous, it's a porous material. So it allows to heat up more relatively. It also allows to cool down more uh, easier on a relative scale. And cast iron has this amazing um, uh, ability to reach through its radiant heat to reach deep into, to penetrate the, its heat deep into the heart of the bean. So now we've had conductive heat, convection heat, radiant heat. So that's, I would say as a set, as a, the three musketeers of uh, heat transfer, these three, ideally as a roasting, uh, as a roaster manufacturer, you want to be able to give the user the optimum um, options to control these three sources of heat. And I think Gießen has been very, very successful in that, in that way. So we can actually allow the machine to behave more like a, a fully or almost fully conductive heat roaster. Um, we can also with the um, controls of our air, of our, fans, we can allow the machine also to behave like a more yeah, fully convection heat roaster. Um, comparatively in the market of roasting machines, an example of a more conductive heat roaster is like a Diedrich. So we can allow the uh, Gießen to roast like a Diedrich or comparatively where, where it comes to the uh, convection heat roasters, we of course have the um, the full convection heat roasters like the civets, or we have uh, convection heat roasters like, you know, like the Loring. So we can also allow the Gießen to roast like a Loring. So, so that's the, I would say the benefit is, is we have here, we have a tool, the Gießen roaster is a tool to modulate its heat transfer in ways that we can find with other roaster brands easily. So when it comes to, you know, you, coming from a different brand of roasting machine and you're diving into uh, a relationship with Gießen, you can actually allow your Gießen to roast um, like that other brand of roaster that you're used to. Because ultimately that brand of roaster will put its stamp or the features of that roaster will put its stamp on the flavor profile of your coffee. Uh, here at Booth Coffee Campus, um, we have, um, a lot of different Gießen machines available for you to try this out. And we can help you also to um, translate the roasting profiles you developed to um, your Gießen machine. Uh, so that's about heat transfer. Really interesting stuff, I think. Um, let's talk about um, air pressure profiling. Now, for those of you who, um, participated in the um, previous webinar a month ago. We, we actually reviewed up close the, the Gießen um, 
control panel, and there are kind of two key screens that you use. One is the, the screen that has the set temperature and the burner level, and the other, maybe Marcus, could you, is there a way for you to show the screen of the Gieson? Mar Marcus is gonna try to show this. You could also use your, your other phone, okay. Let's see. Let's see how well our technical abilities work here. Uh, Marcus, you have to unmute yourself if you want to talk. Yeah, oh, yeah you're live. Everybody. So, um, yeah, here's the primary control screen of the Gison Profiler. And we'll do some live listing with this in a little bit. But you know, I think one of the things that's interesting is we can load up a series of different profiles here. Um, and when I select it. Marcus, it's very hard to hear you apparently. No, maybe well. Um, and there's feedback. So, Marcus, let, let me take over the screen again and then. Um, Okay. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, you have, you have your PC uh, volume on. Right now there's feedback. It's off. Okay. Uh, thanks guys for giving me heads up on the technical issues we have. But basically, Marcus was trying to show you the um, control panel that um, is part of the Gieson profiling software about which one of our next uh, webinars will be. But through the Gieson um, uh, operator panel, you can modulate your um, airflow. And on the Gieson, this is done by pressure profiling. I'm going back to my, um, my presentation. Okay, so everyone can see my screen now. Okay. So, sorry, let, let me reinitiate screen sharing. Okay. Now I should be back, right? Um, thanks guys for suffering with us while we figured this all out. Um, so with the Gieson, you can run your Gieson using a low airflow flow profile or a high airflow profile or a combination of two. And here we have some screenshots of the um, Gieson roast profiling software. If you do not have this software, you can actually recreate this um, by just manipulating the air pressure setting, the PA setting on your Gieson. If you have a older style Gieson that did, does not have the PA set point uh, adjustment, then you can literally just set your Gieson at a low um, airflow altogether. But the air pressure profiling, like in this uh, slide, you can see there is this kind of um, jagged line at 100 PA, that's the um, pressure I was using in this um, profile. Um, 
and you can see at the far end there's a little spike that that, that is some registration of the software but, but we kept in this case the um, profile consistently at 100 pa and then you can see the red line is the beam temperature and the blue line is the air temperature so the distance between the blue line the air temperature and the red line the beam temperature we call that the delta it's the temperature difference between those two um, so when I look what I what happens when I go from a low airflow profile in a high air pro, airflow profile so this is a different roast we did so now um, we had a roast where we had a little slightly longer heat soak where we allow the coffee to uh, absorb the heat of the roaster before we start the, with the burners on. But now we have a high, higher air pressure of 160 PA Pascal. And now look at that delta between the red curve, the bean temperature and the blue curve, the, the air temperature. I'm going to switch back and forth so you can see the difference. Now, Although it might seem visually, optically from your end, not that relevant, you know, this is a very relevant difference. And that is really unique. There are not many other roasters, or there aren't any other roasters as far as I know, that have this ability, unless you spend, you know, a, a, a huge amount of money on a big industrial machine and allow engineers to figure this out for you. And this, as a controllable parameter, is very powerful because I can do these absolute profiles, low airflow, high airflow, or I can do a variable airflow profile where I start at a 100 PA for the first seven minutes, and then I switch to a higher PA of 160 uh, in the second half of the roast. And you can see, in this scenario, we can see um, at that, just beyond that seven minute mark, you can see how quickly the delta between the um, air temperature and the beam temperature changes. And so that delta by itself is indicative for the fact that now we are contributing with more convection heat to the development of the coffee. Now, at the seven point mark, my temperature was, uh, bean temperature, you can follow that on the graph, was somewhere around 320 degrees, right? Now we know um, that at, at about 280 degrees, Maillard reactions really get going. Maillard reactions are really, um, uh, a key um, driver of the chemistry changes within the beans. And at about 310, 320 degrees, those Maillard reactions are um, setting in motion a process of uh, caramelization, which is the, the, the chemistry changes of the sugars within the coffee. As you know, we have a lot of those. And those obviously contribute to sweetness. And so you can say that with the um, airflow pressure profiling, I have the ability to kind of control at what point in the game of roasting I can um, induce certain chemistry changes. And that is, from my perspective, that's like really cool. That's very, very, very cool. Um, so obviously, you know, you can talk a lot about these theoretic aspects, but you've got to, you know, be able to do it, to practice it also. So we're going to actually do a live roast. Marcus is going to try to show this via his feed. First, um, which coffee are we using today? We uh, are using this, this coffee from Guatemala, which is um, um, an interesting coffee. It's a natural processed, Catura. Uh, we cup this coffee and, you know, 
you can see the descriptors here. It's, it's kind of a clean but fruity natural process. Sweet coffee, it has a winey aftertaste with a kind of a green apple flavor. Uh, some other copper found citrix in this. It has a coffee that has like exotic notes, florals, grapes, raspberry, red fruit, strawberries, tangy. Um, and we took some shots of this coffee and you can see here, these are the green beans. So you can see uh, the kind of the natural process of this coffee has created kind of an interesting um, texture from the outside. Uh, overall, I did not measure the density of the coffee. Maybe Marcus did, but yeah, this is on a relative scale, quite a dense coffee. You could, how can I see that? Because I see the kind of the corrugated exterior surface of the beans. I see that the center cut is somewhat tight, somewhat closed. So that is indicative that this coffee can handle a lot of heat potentially. At the same time, however, it's also natural. Natural coffees, you've got to be careful with too much heat. So you've, you, you want to be able to um, potentially reduce your um, rate of rise quite um, dramatically at the seventh minute mark. If you don't, the coffee might just, you know, as we say, run away from you. Um, and here is the roast we did on one of the test roasts. So on an absolute spectrum, um, Marcus, what's Actron that we have for this coffee? This was an Actron 54. Um, we did the three trials that we looked at the profiles from. Um, they were all within one point of 54.5, so quite close. So, so it was an Actron. If you mute your microphone again, Mike, Marcus, thank you. So it was an Actron 54. Um, you know, this is a, a bit darker than cupping color. Um, wh when you're doing cupping color, you're aiming for Actron like 58, 60. Um, and now we are going to go into some live roasting. We're going to demonstrate the feature of the variable airflow. And um, we're going to demonstrate how that can also be used to uh, induce a faster roast with a higher rate of rise. So let's see if we can show this to you as we intend this to. Yeah. Uh, okay, one second. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give me a moment to open the Geeson profiler. I did notice, though, while I do that, um, I think it was Mike McKim I saw asked if we're measuring those Agtron numbers, whole bean or ground. Those were whole bean numbers that we provided. Um, of course, if we were doing this as a full production operation, we would want to be able to compare both the whole bean and the ground colors. And here's my Geeson profiler. Okay. Hopefully we stay connected this time. Last time I pulled this up, um, I lost my entire internet connection. No fault of the profiler. But I'm gonna go ahead and load a reference of um, that sort of low air pressure profile that we had previously. So now this is loaded up as the reference and when I'm ready to start playing that, it will just repeat that entire profile if I allow it to. I'm going to make some overrides because I want to try to 
increase the air pressure later in the roast and also have a little bit of a faster roast. So I'm right about where I want to start my roasting. Give it a five second delay. So a couple of changes that I want to make right away is I'm going to increase my set point just a little bit so I have a little bit more power going in to the end of the roast. I'm going to kind of roll the dice on this development test and see if that's too much power or if we're in an okay spot. Additionally, I was a little bit slower adding my initial gas input on this. So currently my burner is off, but I'm going to go ahead and turn my burner on here at 45 seconds. And I'm just going to use the auto feature so that the software and the profiler and the roaster will toggle. I have no doubt with the um, Okay, I'm taking the sound over for Marcus. This is something we will have to figure out technically how to do and live roasting and how to make this audible um, through the um, Thyssen machine sound. It's more the sound of the beans. Everyone can hear me fine now. If someone can acknowledge that I can continue. Am I? You can hear me well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let me explain what's going on because you're looking at the Gison, um screen. This is the profiler software screen. Um, if you do not have this software or if you don't even have any type of Gison software, if you just have a panel, then I would say, you know, this can be recreated this can be done uh, also without having this software. Um, so we have the gradually the curves start to roll out. My beam temperature um, at this point is 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're just beyond the boiling um, point of water, which is uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or 100 C. So we're now um, in that stage of uh, water being uh, evaporated into vapor and that pressure development starts to induce uh, distinct um, chemistry changes um, to the coffee quite soon. Um, we see our um, air temperature. Uh, I lost the feed. Okay. Okay, we. We unfortunately. Our internet semi crashed trying to do two feeds at the same time. Um, but I'm going to. Um, discuss what we're doing in this roast. And I can try to um, ask Marcus to send me a screenshot once he's done. But basically what we're trying to accomplish here is a variable roast, a variable meaning variable air pressure profiling, starting the air pressure uh, Marcus at 100 PA and then going up to 160 PA. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And um, we're doing this as we speak. I'm looking at the Gieson roaster. You can see in your um, uh, in the other window that Marcus uh, 
that displays Marcus, if you put yourself in um, uh, gallery view on your Zoom, then you will be able to see myself and Marcus next to it. And so, um, so this profile by itself can be recreated if you do not have the most modern, decent profiling system. Okay, Marcus is back. He rebooted his, um, which one shall I do? Your co-host is now. Okay. And Marcus, you have to turn on your uh, turn on your microphone so that you can try to give, or I can I can I can make comments. Let's continue with that. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, here you can see, so at what stage are we now? So we see kind of a yellowing beans. So we're now six minutes into the roast. This is a point where uh, you can see we're now at 325 degrees bean temperature. And now Marcus is increasing his air pressure. So the air pressure, the higher air pressure, what does it do? It tells the roaster, tells the fans of the roaster to work harder um, to maintain this 160 Pascal pressure. What pressure is this? This is the under pressure. This is a like a relative vacuum. So the fans now remove more air than before. And the, um, as a result of that, the convection heat is working harder to facilitate that. So we have now on a relative scale, more convection heat. You can see my uh, rate of rise is still yeah, relatively high. It's 12 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 seconds, which gives me 24 degrees per minute temperature change. So that shows you if my end point would be somewhere in the 390s, then, or maybe 400, then that would give me at this point um, about two, two and a half minutes to go in this roast. So now you can see through the change in air pressure from 100 to 160, you can see the increase of that delta. You can see that the air temperature um, has been rising, is now, uh, it, it's about to rise, it's, it's still 401, the bean temperature is 365. And so that delta, that increased delta will result into either the rate of rise staying at this level or being relatively high. Rate of rise now 10.6. Sorry? Yeah. And so now, in order to control this roast uh, to the level that we want to get a uh, put the brakes on the rate of rise, we're lowering the burner. You can see the burner is now at ten percent. Um, and at the A point, the A point starts right before the first crack. At the A point, the pressure within the beans, now we have the first crack, by the way. Uh, so that is at 384 degrees Fahrenheit, 399 air, uh, seven rate of rise. So at the A point, we have the pressure within the beans, mostly produced by water vapor in combination with oils that vaporize, we can smell the very first precursors of the characteristics of the bean right before the first crack. 
So now, um, at the start of the first crack, we basically then uh, also start to um, count, measure the RG, that's a roast development time. If we express it in a percentage, you can see that on the lower side of this screen, you can see it now is 9%. So it's the time that has expired between the start of the first crack and the um, end of the roast or the position where the roast is right now. So we can see right now this RD is at uh, one minute and 10 seconds and gradually increasing. Uh, I'll, I'll, I will answer all of your questions. Um, okay, here, here asked someone, could you tell the Celsius numbers quickly? Yeah, I would have to look up, look this up on my phone. You can easily do that on your end also. Just Google Fahrenheit to Celsius. The load size in the roaster. What's the load size in the roaster, Marcus? He doesn't hear me because the roast is just being finished. So now we have the end of the roast. The RD roast development time was one minute, 58 seconds. My percentage was 18%. Uh, bean temperature um, at the end of the roast. I will ask Marcus again what it was. I think it was 408. Fahrenheit. Marcus, you want to come here and then take my seat and then you can comment on how this rose went for you? That doesn't work. Just ask them. Give me a heads up about the sounds. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry that the sound is a little rough standing in front of the roaster, but um, we're we're working on the technical issues. So I was quite happy with this roast. You know, my goals for it were to have a faster roast. I also wanted to incorporate that variable airflow. Um, you know, a few things that I was happiest about was seeing the way um, that I was able to sort of extend the roast period a little bit um, after yellowing, sort of. Even after yellowing, you know, that, that phase when the coffee was um, you know, kind of a like cinnamon color, you can see here between six and a half and seven minutes, it, rate, the rate of rice dropped before coming back up just a little bit. You can push it into the first crack. So that pour the water so that you can do the cupping and then I yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And then I'll bring it up. Perfect. We're, um, we're now going to cup the um, previous three profiles that you all saw. So that would be great. Um, and yeah, so I'm, I'm quite happy with the way that this roast went. You know, my goal was to craft something very different than the previous three profiles. I think what we're going to cup in just a minute, we're going to illustrate three roasts that were very similar from the perspective of total roast time, development time, and end color. This roast, now uh, this fourth roast is like a totally different approach to this coffee with a much shorter overall roast time, with a slightly shorter development time. We have a development time now of only um, 18%. It was actually closer to about 17 and a half, whereas the development times for the previous roasts were in the um, 21 to 22% time. I think, I haven't measured the Agtron yet, but I'm fairly confident that the roast color on this is still right there in that 54, 55 Agtron Gourmet. So you know, maybe a little bit darker, as Willem said, than a cupping roast, certainly slightly darker than, um, than the roast that we would um, expect for kind of a light medium roast, as we often roast our coffees here. So I'm pretty excited about how this will taste. I think I have some expectations of what it'll taste like, but um, we're not certain. It's all what's in the cup. So I see Willem is over here. He has poured some water. and. We are ready to um, get our noses into the aromas of roasts A, B, and C. Roast A 
was the growth of um, the low air air pressure. Rose B was the higher air pressure, and rose C was the original variable air pressure. So there's um, rose A at 100 pascals of pressure. Rose B, very similar, but with 160 pascals. Rose C, we moved the air pressure from 100 pascals to 160 pascals in the seven minute mark. So, you know, for this cupping, we're going to treat it, you know, very much as I would recommend our clients treat some of their production cuppings. To do a full formal SCA scoring might be a little bit overwhelming if you're cupping 20, 50, 80 production batches per day. But having a very straightforward, simple form that asks the tasters to assess key important characteristics of your coffee can be um, a great way to do that, especially if you sort of know what the reference of that coffee is. So in this case, we will take coffee A as our reference. And you know, if coffee B and coffee C match the flavor for that, match the acidity and match the mouthfeel, we would simply put a tick mark right in the center of these scales. But in any case where the flavor, acidity, or mouthfeel are improved, we would rank it higher if it um, is worse, we would like that lower, and then we have a place to write some notes about each cup. And I think you know, through a system like this, it's a great way to evaluate various profiles and make a determination of which do you like the best. So we are ready to roll and break our cups. Okay, um, I can I can bring the computer over there. Has to be reversed. Okay, perfect. So Marcus is now breaking the crust on these coffees. And let's see if I So obviously, uh, when it comes to the um, uh, cupping, that is by itself the validation of the work that has been done, right? And uh, cupping and also quality inspection, like color inspection and density inspection, those measurements are key. But then cupping and being able to do this in a um, uh, calibrated way. It's really important to be able to continually tell that you as the roaster that you're doing a decent job, right? Um, I see a lot of questions coming in. L let me first also dive into this coffee. Marcus, could you point the, that phone to my screen? So. Yeah. So A was the uh, the benchmark, right? Yep. Yeah. Coffee A is the benchmark. So I'm getting like uh, on the aromatics kind of chocolatey tones. There's a kind of a little bit of a clean leather uh, roasted nuts. Um, so now I'm going to B, which is the Uh, low airflow coffee, right? Um, a is low airflow. Oh, A is low airflow, B is high airflow, airflow. and C is the variable. variable. Okay. I, you know, I still smell the same descriptors in B versus A. Um, 
I, I would almost say it has become a bit more chocolatey, kind of caramel. I, I agree. I thought A was a little bit flat and cereally, like cacao nibs. Yeah. Whereas B was much more like dynamic, like a fine so he, chocolate. He found, Marcus found A more like cereal, cacao nibs, and B was more, a bit more dynamic, you said? Yeah, dynamic, dark chocolate. Yeah, dark chocolate. Right and now I'm going to smell C. Um, it appears that what we were trying to do in the aromatics, it appears that it was successful. By the way, sorry for the mess that I create here. I'm, I always am giving my students a hard time when they pour this badly and boy, boy, I, I was my own worst example, right? Um, yeah, and Marcus tray is really clean, right? And maybe that's indicative for the personalities you're dealing with here, right? Um, so, aromatics is one part. I, I think, you know, don't underestimate aromatics, especially when you assess flavor profiles. But ultimately, it's really in the flavor also. Um, where you're doing air pressure profiling um, trials, then I think it's essential to focus very much on the acidity that you find in the coffee. And so now I'm going to see, oh, this is, put these out. Um, so I'm first going to test A. It is quite remarkable huh? that um, I uh, tasted A, that's the low airflow, the lower pressure setting, 100 PA. Um, you know, I, I still get consistent notes in the flavor as in the aroma. Uh, this chocolate, kind of a, you know, like a clean leather. There's nothing bad about that. It's, you know, I, I also think like a dried blackberry of some sort or a dried um, fig, like a black mission fig. We grow them in our yards. Um, and then B, because that was roasted with the high airflow, the 160 PA, at that point, the fan is working harder. The acidity is much more pronounced. It seems like this coffee, um, it almost seems like the coffee became younger, uh, showing less um, signs of age than in the case of uh, the profile of A. Um, I find it's more fresh fruit. Think of your head, I'll, I'll give you the... Yeah, I find B to be much more fresh fruit as opposed to dried fruit. Um, the acidity just has this really nice crisp, um, citric acid to it. Um, I still also find malic acid in there, so similar to the cupping notes that we found on this coffee. Um, just much more dynamic, you know, maybe where it is a little bit less interesting is in the mouthfeel. I find the mouthfeel is um, kind of thin with B, but it's still very silky, whereas with A it's got this like kind of thick, heavier mouthfeel. Uh, thank you, Marcus. So now I'm going to test C because that's the the kind of the composite profile, right? Mm -hmm. So here we have, we've really put the Giesen profiler to work. Um, so I perceive like this coffee has 
it seems like there is like there are more levels in the first two examples you know i had more absolute um visuals when i tried to visualize the flavor profile with a it was more bass notes more body notes with b more um, acidity more pronounced acidity and with c i get both i get in my first taste i taste those darker chocolate kind of almost baker chocolate notes and then in c in the higher notes i do taste um like this these uh citrus notes produced by dried fruit like a dried fruit um upper level in that flavor profile what what uh, marcus uh, just um yeah i think c kind of loses the refreshing quality of b but it does bring he, more he says that. you know c loses the refreshing quality of b um, but it gains a, like a richness and a depth but it has a lot of richness and depth all right cool this was cool uh, i always like it when things don't work uh, when things work out <laughs> i would prefer to drink b but i would prefer to sell c yeah Marcus says he would prefer to drink B, but he would love to try to sell more of C, right? Why does he say that? Because C is harder probably to reproduce by your competition. So now you have with C, uh, with that, um, uh, yeah, my composite profile, you've created really put your stamp, your signature on that flavor profile. Um, so that was cool. Um, there are some questions that I'm going to dive into before we um, close this session down. I, I think, you know, given the discussions we get with these sessions, um, it's always cool to consider a longer uh, roasting seminar. I'll, I'll, I'll ask our friends at Gießen if they are open for that, um, for that thought. Um, just going to address some questions. There are some general questions on um, that could be best answered by the sales team of Gießen. I will uh, channel those to the um, sales team. Uh, what does 18% mean? That's the uh, development time. It's the development time expressed in percentage. You basically um, time from the start of the first crack, you start measuring the time until the end of the roast. So if that time is three minutes and your overall, your roast was, was let's say 12 minutes, then your de development time in percentage is 25%. And so it's the percentage is calculated that way. Um, the RPM of the drum, how does it affect the roast development? Great question. That's actually um, a topic for the webinar, I think in August. So. So check back in August because we're going to do very similar um, trials as we did today with the RPMs. Uh, Ovidio Diaz asked, do you have a preference to airflow setting depending on varietal and or process? Well, um, yes, I have found that um, varieties or processes or coffees that um, uh, are that have very distinct floral notes, you obviously want to um, uh, treat the, those coffees with sufficient airflow. So it seems to be um, a good principle to allow at some stage in the roast for a slightly higher airflow setting with those floral coffees. But again, you know, you have to assess this from type to type. There's not an absolute rule to this. But, but in general, yes, you can say that the, um, like the, like a profile like we did today for uh, this third option, option C, might very well work for floral coffees. The coffees, you know, like Pacamara, like Geisha, like, you know, Java. Uh, and I can um, um, keep you busy for a few hours talking about all the other varieties of which I might think that might be done best with certain settings. It, that will be cool for, uh, as a topic for one of the next uh, Eastern seminars, by the way. The, uh, there's a question about the burner. Uh, the burner um, 
that I showed in this webinar is the is a um, so-called ribbon burner, ribbon burner. Very common burner also for high-end uh, heating devices nowadays. Uh, there's a question about Giesen versus Probat. I will channel that to David and his team. David Sutfin, who is um, the Giesen sales and engineer expert here in the US. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you that Probat, although it's a it's good, great, great machine, I would say Giesen, it, this ability of air pressure profiling cannot be found on a Probat. Um, there's a question, how about the small flick at 10 minutes 40? Looks like a flick and crush. Would this not influence the fruity character in a negative way? Thanks. Um, you know, this uh, flick can also be the, just the result of some readings of our thermocouples. Um, I would have to um, very specifically look at this profile again to, um, uh, tell you whether or not this was something from the coffee or something different. Usually there is a uptake uh, or a flick, sometimes a crush, where you are approaching the A point, which is before the first crack. In this case, I'm not sure. There's Pierre asks, why in your opinion is Giesen better? Pierre, how many days do you have to talk with us about this? I would say, you know, Come and check it out with your, uh, with your own coffee. So if there's a Giesen near where you are, or if you are somewhat near California or near Pennsylvania, then take your coffee, test roast on a Giesen, and then test roast on, a, on a, any other type of roaster, cup the results. And you know that's, that will generally give you a lot of information, right? Um, last question from uh, an attendee. How drastic is the change of taste profile starting from high PA and then switching to lower PA, closer to crack with lower heat? So, so the question is, you know, if we do it like an inverted profile versus C, how drastic is the change there? Um, I haven't done that with this specific coffee. I can tell you there will be a major difference uh, to uh, predict how the difference is without doing it uh, is a bit tough. Um, Luis asks us if we want to simulate these settings without having the software so you can do this in your own uh, environment without the software by just um, doing this through your small operator panel on your operator console by just modulating the PA and keeping track of it on a uh, profiling, roast profiling log uh, if you have a first generation Giesen that did not have the PA parameter, then you could simply do this by increasing or decreasing the fan speed. And that generally works quite well as well. Diligent cupping is always required. Um, well, I can tell, you know, all these topics, they raise so many interesting questions. So I just want to, um, um, tell you, we have at Booth Coffee, we have ongoing um, e-webinars uh, that we host. You can find the program at bootcoffee.com. So these webinars can be done anywhere in the world from your own leisure, from your own home. We also have uh, a, a program of um, learning videos uh, and materials through our affiliated website, coffeecourses.com. And after that time, if you're by that time not tired of seeing my face, then you can just join us for the next Gießen webinar. There will be a recording of this webinar available through the Gießen website. And um, it was great having you here virtually. Hope we can meet in person. Good luck with your day. Have a great weekend. And we will be in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys and gals. Um, and I hope um, this will be um, uh, as great next week. Thank you, Benito. I'm missing Panama as well. Yes. Thank you all, and um, have a great day. Bye-bye.